Russia has threatened to take what it calls retaliatory steps of its neighbor Finland's move to join NATO. In a statement, Moscow's foreign ministry says the move could seriously damage bilateral relations as well as security and stability in Northern Europe. This follows uh, calls by Finland's government for the country to apply for NATO membership without delay. Rosie Birchett reports from Brussels where NATO is headquartered. It's hard to overstate just how momentous a move this is for European security. Now, for decades, more than 70 years since NATO was born, Finland has stayed away from the alliance, happy to be a partner but not a member, and staying non-aligned while keeping up ties with Moscow in a business-like manner. But Russia's invasion of Ukraine has changed that completely. Support for NATO membership among the Finnish population has shot up since war erupted and the country's sense of safety appears to really have been shattered. Now Sweden is likely to follow in Finland's footsteps and the two nations are expected to formally apply to NATO together in the coming days. Some formalities will follow but the alliance will likely welcome these two countries with open arms. This will not be welcome news in Moscow. Finland and Russia share a border which is more than 1,300 kilometers long and the Kremlin claims joining NATO will not improve stability for Helsinki. Russia has also threatened to deploy extra nuclear weapons in the Baltic Sea region to rebalance the situation as it says if Finland joins the club. But once in, Helsinki will be able to count on defensive support from big military powers like the United States. NATO members take a collective defense pledge which which is known as Article 5. It says an attack on one is an attack on all. Now, Moscow is opposed to any sort of NATO expansion. It says the alliance is a threat to its security and wants less NATO near its borders. But the opposite appears to now be happening. It's all part of the fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Rosie Burchard, SABC News, Brussels. Dave uh, Derosh is uh, professor at the National Defence University and former NATO operations director at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He joins us now from Washington, D.C. to speak a little bit more about this. A very good evening to you and thank you so much for speaking to us. That is uh, our time. Let's talk about what Russia says it sees as a security threat. We know that this has been the justification for its entry into Ukraine. Again, you and I have had this conversation about what Russia considers to be a security threat. Why would it feel threatened by Finland's entry into NATO? Well, it, it sees any uh, expansion uh, as a threat to its security. And quite frankly, it sees any exercise of full sovereignty by any neighboring country as a threat to its security. Uh, Russia basically views uh, the euro area as its sphere of influence and uh, basically holds that it needs to have a, a veto over decisions made by other sovereign states in what it defines as its sphere of influence. Mm. Uh, NATO and uh, Russia had at some point a forum in which to discuss some of these issues. Right now what Russia is saying is that this, the retaliatory reaction that it's threatening depends on how close NATO military action comes to the 1,300 kilometer Finnish Russian frontier. So what would be considered that? Well, good question. I, I actually addressed the NATO Russia forum in 2004. Um, it wasn't as vibrant as uh, you would hope for. It was more of a talking shop that meant weekly to discuss issues of concern to the alliance in Russia. And that was before, um, you know, the invasion of Georgia, which really set off a, a new era in Russia relations. So there is a concern uh, that, you know, the frontage that NATO has with Russia, which right now is just the Arctic uh, frontier with Norway, uh, the uh, former, uh, uh, the states that uh, Russia attacked when it was united with Hitler, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and then uh, the uh, Polish uh, and uh, Lithuanian uh, contact with Russia's colony in Kaliningrad. There is concern that, you know, those are relatively small frontiers and having a much longer frontier along the Finnish border would uh, increase the potential for conflict. But, you know, the Finns uh, have been pretty, uh, you know, they're, they 
they are not an aggressive people by nature. Uh, they are um, uh, proudly independent, and there hasn't been any conflict across the border since uh, 1944. So I think that there's a, a real possibility that, again, this is just Putin trying to uh, uh, scare people. Hmm. There are those who say the Finnish move could be replicated by Sweden. Is there a danger of that? And what would it mean for uh, a discussion? Would, be, would it be all bets off, so to speak, in terms of what Russia considers as its umbrella of security? A good question. So I, I don't think it would be considered to be a danger, um, uh, but I think that Sweden probably will join. It really is quite remarkable when you look at this. I mean, Sweden and Finland have been neutral as long as I've been alive and longer. And uh, as recently as two years ago, you know, only about 20 to 30 percent of the Finnish population uh, you know, was in favor of joining NATO. Now that's a, almost 80 percent. Same thing with Sweden, which has been proudly neutral for centuries. Uh, what, it real, what it shows is just a recognition of the threat posed by Putin's doctrine. And uh, I think they've come to the conclusion that they can't remain neutral because that just means they'll be vulnerable to Putin's whims. So it, it is an unfortunate development in that sense. Um, I think the good thing is these are two countries that have real military capabilities that they're bringing to NATO. Unlike other countries which had to be reformed and developed, they'll, they'll slot right in. Um, I've served in uh, Bosnia and Afghanistan alongside uh, uh, Finnish and Swedish forces, and they're modern professional armies. So it, there's really less there than, than meets the eye. Uh, you know, they're, they're already kind of cooperating on issues of national concern. Mm. So there are minimum requirements, to my understanding, for NATO to allow or uh, accept ap application, as it were, for membership into NATO. So, so far, Ukraine mm -hmm. has failed to hit the mark. Talk to us about why and why would Finland be an ideal candidate, as some are saying? No, good, good question. These are really good questions. So. Um, there's a requirement for countries to uh, demonstrate a commitment to NATO ideals. That means democratic leadership. That means uh, accountability. And also that they, uh, you know, will have some sort of military capacity. So Ukraine, uh, you know, it's, it's a highly imperfect democracy. It's one of the most corrupt countries, one of the more corrupt countries in the earth. I think it scored 117 out of 180 in the most recent Transparency International. And honestly, I don't think Ukraine uh, accession to NATO was something uh, that was ever, you know, that, that anybody ever saw happening, you know, within my lifetime. Um, most of the countries that have joined NATO since the end of the Cold War are former East Bloc countries. And they did it at a time when we thought history it had ended. And quite frankly, the European members of NATO s saw NATO as sort of a, a testing ground to see if a country could join the European Union. That was the real prize, the economic integration of the European Union. What's so interesting about Sweden and Finland is that they have modern armed forces that don't have to be rebuilt and reformed like, say, the Czech army after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and they're already members of the European Union. So these are countries that meet all of the criteria for NATO membership. And they don't have ongoing conflicts because they've been neutral forever. Mm. So it's, it's sort of a no-brainer. Um, and it really just shows, I mean, this analysis that I just went over, you know, Putin could have done this on the back of an envelope. But by invading Ukraine, he's basically created a decision where, you know, these countries have set aside decades of neutrality in Finland's case and centuries in Sweden's case. And they see that as an existential issue that really has to be laid at the feet of Vladimir Putin. So there are those who have taken the non-aligned approach, including South Africa, India, China, saying that Russia deserves to be heard out, whether, you know, those who are United Nations General Assembly members agree or not, that its complaints need to be heard out. And one of the things that it, it, it pointed to was the treatment of uh, people in the Donbass. And I want you to talk about some of those minimum requirements of NATO. It talks about um, not 
only having a functioning democracy, but treating minority populations fairly. Um, so is this part of the problem with the Ukraine, whether um, the West wants to agree with Russia or not? Is this, does it cast aspersions on the Ukraine and why it hasn't been able to convince NATO? Mm. Uh, I honestly have not heard that issue raised except in Russian propaganda. Uh, I don't think that there has been any um, systemic treatment, uh, a mistreatment uh, of the uh, uh, Rus ethnically Russian population in the Donbass prior to its annexation by Russia in 2014. However, uh, you know, they were a... Um, a minority within, you know, a broader Ukraine. Um, paradoxically, this is another own goal by Putin. Had he not annexed the Crimea Donbass in 2014, then there would have been 30 percent of the population of Ukraine that would be Russian. That presumably, you know, in the democratic process would say, no, of course we don't want to be part of NATO. But when he removed that big ethnic Russian population from the from the electoral base in Ukraine, what was left was a embittered remainder that was looking towards the West. Um, but all that being said, NATO is not going to admit a country that's at war because as soon as the country is admitted, NATO would be obligated to go to war. And the second thing is there are, you know, Ukraine looks good to everybody in the West right now because it's being invaded by Russia. Uh, but Ukraine is a highly imperfect democracy. And if it were not being invaded by Russia, I still think that just on corruption and uh, democratic grounds and respect for human rights and institutions, free press, it would still be challenged to meet the criteria for NATO membership. Mm -hmm. So if uh, Finland and Sweden were to be admitted into NATO, and this uh, I'd imagine would include if it is indeed the intention of Ukraine in future uh, months or years, I understand that there is a military or rather uh, an action plan, membership action plan that needs to be advanced. Mm -hmm. So... Talk to me about what stands in favor for Sweden and Finland, even though you have mentioned their military capacity. Yeah. I know that this is a part of what would be expected contribution to military power. So what has well, the Ukraine yeah. done thus far? And why well, would Sweden and Finland yeah. be in good stead? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm unaware of a military action plan for the Ukraine. Um, I don't think that discussions with NATO have ever reached that stage. Um, I think that for Sweden and uh, Finland, uh, doing the military action plan for NATO accession would be a relatively uh, quick and easy um, uh, matter because they are modernized forces. Uh, they have taken part in NATO exercises. They've deployed uh, alongside NATO forces, as I said, to Afghanistan and Bosnia. Um, that whole idea of the military action plan for NATO membership is oriented towards the countries that joined the alliance in the 90s and the early 2000s, these former uh, Soviet bloc states who uh, were left with, you know, equipment that was rusting and inoperable, who had a dysfunctional command system where officers were promoted for political loyalty rather than efficacy. That's really what it's for. Uh, I don't think it's a problem for either uh, Sweden or Finland. Um, their militaries are better than that of several NATO members I could, I, I am not going to name. Um, but uh, again, I don't think that at the bureaucratic sense, Ukraine accession to NATO was ever imminent. 